Thank you for coming in and sharing this a little bit. Uh, first, to run through what I'd be talking about in the next 20, 25 minutes, uh, a little bit on conventional biogas generators for those who are anaerobic digesters, for those who aren't too familiar, uh, basically run through a design and then talk about some of the challenges faced with conventional non-mixed biogas generators. Um, and then I thought that I'd kind of break away on a bit of a tangent and uh, more or less discuss a bit about the background of frontier environmental technology. To put it in perspective, more or less where we came from, uh, we actually started research about three or four years ago on some different things, always with a focus on simplicity, energy efficiency, that sort of thing. Uh, and sometimes it helps to understand where you, or to talk about where you've been and understand where you're going. Um, and then basically get into the self mix and biogas generator, how it operates, the data that we collected, and more or less next steps. So conventional biogas generators, oh, and, and a bit of house planning, US, I'm accustomed to talking about feet and inches, so like conversions and all that. I apologize in advance. But a conventional biogas generator, which probably many of you are familiar with, essentially you've got an influent where your feedstock goes into. You've got uh, then usually stratified layers within the generator or the digester where you'll have inactive material or inorganic material at the bottom, especially dead space, and then a layer of active material where a lot of your gas is being generated. Uh, and then uh, probably supernatant and possibly a bit of floating scum sludge at the top. And then you've got an effluent line and a settling tank where some uh, uh, solids, liquid separation occurs. Uh, and then at the top, you've got a port to retrieve your biogas. This is a picture uh, of a biogas generator being built to serve as a, a single family, assumably uh, four or five people uh, in a, a northern province in China. And you'll know that it's, it's fairly large, a number of grown men who fit in it, and they're building it out of bricks and mortar. Uh, you've got the primary chamber here, and then that effluent tank is over here. Um, now there's a number of challenges that I mentioned uh, that you face when you talk about conventional non-mixed biogas generators. And the first is the large size, which you saw there. Essentially the larger something is, the more expensive it is to build more material at more time. Unless of course you're talking about computers, then for some reason that's more expensive, the smaller you can put it But that's for another day. Um, also, when you get into building very large uh, generators, reactors and you can't transport them in so much basically you have to build them on site and so when you do that particularly in a rural rural setting you're really talking about using whatever labor is available oftentimes unskilled labor uh, perhaps using rudimentary tools lack of plans that sort of thing to build these reactors and that basically comes together and results in poor operation more or less these things you'll have gas leakage uh, perhaps you have um, uh, leakage of, of liquids from the reactor down to the water table, and that sort of thing, which can ultimately result in failure of the reactor. Last, but certainly not least, uh, in terms of challenges, is the maintenance involved with a non-mixed reactor. A lot of times these are built oversized, not necessarily for the retention time necessary for degradation, but because over time, if you remember when I mentioned the stratification inside that reactor, at the bottom, you get a buildup of inorganic material, inactive material. Over time, that reduces the active volume of the reactor. And so, basically, uh, if you want this thing to last a number of years, you have to make it bigger than it otherwise would have to be. And so, every two, three, five years, whatever that may be, depending upon a number of variables, you're looking at having to go into the reactor and clean it out, because over time, it produces less and less gas. And so not only is that an expense to hire people to come in to do that and figure out how you're going to dispose of the material that you're removing from the reactor, but also there's the challenge of, okay, well, what are you going to do with the waste while the reactor's out of service? That's another issue. And then, pardon me, and then once you're ready to start back up again, you can use some of your seed from before and reseed the reactor, but there's going to be a significant amount of time between when you start that up and when you reach steady state. Anaerobic processes being very, very slow, that could be a number of weeks or perhaps even months before you can reach 
steady state, achieve good degradation and good gas production. So uh, more and more in the developed world, what people have been looking at is providing mixers for these reactors. And by mixing, you increase the kinetics, but perhaps more importantly, and this is a secret just between you and I, it helps to uh, mix up that inorganic inactive material and remove that from the reactor. So you can utilize a greater active volume in that reactor uh, and produce more gas over time, less maintenance, less cleanup, theoretically. Um, now to step just away on a and put some things in perspective here. Uh, as far as the background on frontier environmental, what we've been doing for the last few years, we actually started looking at conventional wastewater treatment plants. And we were focused really on three things. Simplicity, how to make something that's really complex, much more simple. How to do it in a way that we reduce moving parts, make as many static components as possible. So you decrease operation and maintenance. Um, making these things energy efficient, all while at the same time either increasing uh, treatment efficiency, or at least maintaining it, but ideally increasing it. So this is basically a sketch of a conventional activated sludge system where you've got a pre anoxic zone or a zone, final clarifier for a liquid solid separation, return some of the sludge pump, um, and then there's some return up here. Well, generally this is so complicated, you've got a number of pumps and you have to hire a full-time operator to run this thing to get it to work right. And so what we did, essentially the first innovation uh, we came up with was basically an internal settler, a, uh, a staged quiescent zone, where you have solids come in here, they begin to settle, and the mixing that occurs by aeration in the aerobic zone creates a convective force, induces a vacuum whereby solids are then pulled from the internal settler back into the aeration zone. So you get a dilute uh, and supernatant fluid into the final clarifier, reduces the flow the final clarifier, uh, takes out a number of pumps, reduces operational maintenance needs, and as a, an additional side effect, we're actually able to increase biomass in the reactor, which provides better treatment. So it was a win-win-win. Now we took this and we started uh, developing it more, and we applied basically a different process to it, an aerobic anox, alternating aerobic anox process, uh, previous to terms. And so what we would do here, rather than have a pre anoxic zone, we uh, aerate uh, for about 90 minutes, and then turn to anoxic for 90 minutes. And aeration is, is very simple, you know, high oxygen, great well time. But when it came to anoxic mixing, we were left with somewhat of a challenge. And that challenge was, okay, well, we didn't want to put in uh, physical mixers because that would be another electric motor. You got to grease bearings, more operation maintenance, and a greater electric consumption. So we looked at using an airlift pump, which we had used before for some mixing and liquid transport <coughs> purposes. And the way that an airlift pump works, for those that are not familiar, basically you have a pipe. You inject air into the pipe, bubbles go up through the pipe and it makes the water and the liquid inside the pipe more buoyant than the surrounding liquid. So as the air moves up and through, it pulls liquid in the bottom and it checks it out of the top. You can uh, mix somewhat with this, you can get a little bit of a hydraulic lift. But for the purposes here, that wasn't going to work because we couldn't keep an anoxic zone anoxic. We'd have oxygen transfer from the bubble to the surrounding liquid. So we reinvented the air lift. And what we did was we have a tube, and we put a collar around the bottom of the tube, and we inject air into the collar. And then over time, as we injected that air, the volume would increase and increase and increase. And then once it got to a, uh, a critical volume, all that air and gas would go into the tube all at once and create essentially a colossal bubble in that tube, which would create a very large vacuum, flow the tube, full solids, uh, quite viscous solids, as a matter of fact from the bottom of the tube and injected at the top. And this is a picture of uh, basically in a, a pilot scale wastewater treatment plant and uh, a six inch, uh, one of these surge pumps is what we call them, can effectively mix roughly a, a, a three meter area running on nothing but about two cubic feet per minute of air. And it stays nice. So that is what was essentially the full concept for the self-mixing biogas generator. <clears throat> and uh, here's a quick video. And it, it's, you will, right now we're actually injecting air into the bottom of it. Um, 
but normally small bubbles would nucleate in the solution and float up and enter the collar here. And as they float up and enter that, that volume increases, increases, increases until it reaches a, uh, a critical stage, at which point the entire gas enters this uh, center column here and then full solids, not there, not there, but here. So that was uh, performed during the uh, initial wet test. So we knew that it would work, or at least we thought that it would work. And we knew from past literature that additional mixing will increase efficiencies and that sort of thing. So we started out with three uh, bench scale reactors that were roughly um, five feet tall, just short of a meter tall, uh, by a third of a meter by a third of a meter. Um, last, because we wanted to see what was going on in them. And, uh, and we had one control, non-mixed, and then two experimentals with slightly different configurations for that self-mixing device. Uh, we ran these for several months and there was many challenges involved. And we had a bunch of data and there was really no conclusive evidence that uh, the experimental was producing more gas than control. And basically what would happen is we'd fire these up, we'd get them going, they'd run for 10 or 14 days, and then we'd have an issue. Uh, we started out, for example, with half-inch pipes for inflow and F1 those clogged up, we make a change, um, something else would happen. Uh, the force of these pumps, by the way, is, is very large. Uh, we're, we were in a, a 28 foot, essentially a, a, a nine meter roughly box trailer. You know, this, this was partitioned off so we could maintain a, a specific temperature in this room. And you could be in the other side of it and it would shake the whole trailer when these things would fire. So we knew that they were firing on their own. Um, but that violent, basically, motion of this pump here caused glass to crack. And uh, we took one out of commission, I think, in May, and then in June, I actually shattered the side of the other one. It took several hours to clean up, and it was a terrible experience. Uh, and at that point, we ditched the glass reactors all together, and we came back, and we built two steel reactors uh, to test these. We knew that we had uh, leaking problems with the gas reactors. And I'll get into why we knew that in a bit. Um, basically, we built these, we installed them, and at the same time, we were always looking for a better and better way to measure gas output. Uh, and eventually, at some point, we decided, we, we went and invested in the, in the most expensive, highest quality gas sampling bags that we could find, uh, which then were put on back order for, for a significant amount of time. So, we got these up and running, uh, and it, at some point about here, we actually got those high quality gas bags. And after that, if we look at, at, at this, after the steel reactors and after new gas bags, we're starting to generate good favorable data with the exception of a couple points. One, uh, gas flow when it broke here. Um, we had to make a change inside one of the reactors. We had inserted a baffle in the experimental to try to mitigate some of the uh, uh, floating sludge that we were seeing uh, from the mix and, and it actually uh, counterproductive. So we had to go in there and pull that out. When we did that, we introduced oxygen to the reactor, um, anaerobic bacteria was by oxygen, so they didn't want that and shut it down. Well, it, it, it caused some production problems here. Um, and then we had, we basically lowered the temperature. And unlike the previous presentation, when we went from about 34 degrees C down to 18 or 20 degrees C, we saw about a 70 to 80% decrease in gas production although the experimental reactor was producing more gas than the control reactor this entire time. Um, but if we remove these instances, this, this, and, and, and the low temperature, we call that basically the best data here. And then this is a, a comparison between the data that we collected, first with the gas reactors, the steel, the steel with the new bags, and then finally that best data. So if we're looking at the best data, we're essentially, uh, more or less, uh, 35 to 40 percent uh, more efficient, or created about 35 to 40 percent more gas out of that uh, experimental reactor than the control reactor. And I mentioned before that we knew at one point uh, that we were getting a, a significant amount of data. And the way that we knew that was. I went in and, and said, well, I wonder what the production looks like every eight hours over the course of 48 hours. Uh, for this data, we were essentially, for this data, we, we were uh, 
feed in the reactor every 24 hours, uh, to every 24 to 48 hours. And then I normalize that for this by basically dividing the time through. And what we saw here, uh, this was for the glass, and then for the steel with the new bag we saw here, but uh, two things. One, um, if I added up the total gas accumulation, this plus this plus this plus this, the total there was greater than what I would typically see over a 24 or 48 hour period. It was much more pronounced for what I looked into. There's a, a couple of possible explanations. The first could be mechanical, uh, where we're basically purging that pump here, and then for the second period, perhaps there's gas accumulation in that collar that hasn't come up. It's compressed gas being under the liquid surface. Um, but that didn't seem likely because we've got basically two test points what we're looking at here, so I don't really believe the coincidences so much. Uh, this is more likely something biological, and if we uh, look at Minogue kinetics, it could be one of two things, and uh, either when we put in the substrate, we're quickly uh, utilizing the readily biodegradable DOD, uh, creating a lot of gas, and then as it switches from readily to biodegradable to possibly not readily biodegradable, uh, we see a die down and then an increase, but I don't think that that uh, holds. I, I think that more than likely what we're actually saying is that uh, we're actually degrading all the substrate here in the first eight hours, and then this decline, we're actually seeing decay of the organism and starvation. And as they go into endogenous decay and they start cannibalization, then we're seeing uh, an increase in biogas production. So if the latter is true, and more experimentation is needed, a more active sludge, then it, it, it could be that we're seeing uh, up to twice as much uh, gas reduction between the experimental control. Uh, this is sort of what we've done over the last 12 months, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lack of conclusions in that regard. Um, but as far as next steps go, um, <clears throat> a full scale prototype, basically we, we need to scale this thing up. Right now we've been operating a very small prototype and we've had challenges in, in gas collection and measurement. As I mentioned, we've been using bags. Uh, we, we were looking for a flow meter that we could give us an instantaneous reading and also a, a totalizer that had a totalizer on it. Um, but that was difficult because our gas flow was so low. Um, so we needed that. We need to apply more active feed. We're talking about putting it into a, a swine farm or something similar and using basically swine waste uh, to feed the reactor. That'll improve performance. Um, it should increase mixing, uh, more active feed to get more gas mixing, or more gas generation, and that would uh, result in a greater mixing frequency. And, and finally, a, a viscosity stress test, either artificial or naturally, we really need to increase the viscosity or the solids concentration of the liquid in the reactor and find out at what point that, uh, that pump fails. Um, on top of all that, we need to do general modeling and stuff so that once we, can, uh, once we, once we come through this, we can uh, then have a better idea of exactly what the reactor needs to look like for different uh, installations in different uh, areas. Um, beta test, and once we get through that, and have some good models put in place, and then really get a good uh, full-scale prototype design, uh, we've been in contact with people and we look to test at Madagascar and Kenya and China. Um, and then lastly, uh, finalize a bit of our plan and probably results in one around, uh, or revolving around a licensing strategy of some sort. And that went a lot quicker than I expected, so.